right, so tonight's presentation is An Evening for Dog Lovers with best-selling author Peter uh, Zoitlin. Wanted to make sure I got that right, Peter. So dog lovers are invited to a feel-good presentation with New York Times best-selling author Peter Zoitlin. Uh, Zoitlin will discuss his recent 9,000-mile cross-country journey with his beloved rescue dog. This was inspired by a rereading of John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. Dog lovers, baby boomers, and anyone who seeks to experience life on the open road with a four-legged companion will enjoy this evening. So Peter is the author of three best-selling books about dogs, and I apologize if I'm shortchanging you, uh, Peter, but I get you down for three. Uh, Rescue Road, One Man, 30,000 Dogs, and a Million Miles on the Last Hope Highway. Uh, Rescued, What Second Chance Dogs Teach Us About Living with Purpose, Loving with Abandon, and Finding Joy in the Little Things. And then uh, the book that Peter will be speaking about specifically tonight, The Dog Went Over the Mountain, Travels with Elby, and American Journey. Uh, Peter is also a freelance journalist whose uh, his work has appeared regularly in many publications, including the Boston Globe and the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, and he's previously worked uh, with the New York Times, the LA Times, and AARP Magazine. So all uh, 25 of us or so, let's give a big round of applause to Peter for joining us here tonight. And Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Um, you should be able to see slides on your screen. I hope you can. Um, I want to thank the library for inviting me. This is the first talk I've given this way, so I'm, it's a little bit unfamiliar to me. I won't know if you've dozed off. If I make a joke, I won't know if you're laughing at me or with me. So I'm just going to dive right in and hope for the best. Um, like many of you, I suspect, I started reading John Steinbeck in junior high school, when my eighth grade class was assigned to read Of Mice and Men, one of the first novels that many of us uh, ever read. And I've always loved Steinbeck because Steinbeck always spoke for the downtrodden and the forgotten and the marginalized people in society. And two of my favorite novels of all time were East of Eden and Grapes of Wrath, two of Steinbeck's greatest books. But it was rereading travels with Charlie a few years ago that inspired me to take my dog Albie on this cross-country trip that resulted in this book, The Dog Went Over the Mountain. Um, but before I talk about that book, I want to talk for a moment about the subtitle of Travels with Charlie. You can see it on your screen there. It was subtitled In Search of America. Why is it that this four-word phrase, very simple, in search of America, why is it so evocative? Why do so many of us, and I met, Albie and I met a lot of people doing the same thing we were doing on the road. Why do we go off in search of a place that's literally right beneath our feet? And what are we looking for? And why hasn't somebody already found it? Why is it so elusive that generation after generation, Americans take to the road in search of America? And you may remember, of course, the famous song by Simon and Garfunkel with, with this line. I think the phrase resonates for us as Americans for two reasons. First of all, when we talk about going in search of America, we're not talking really about a physical place. We're not talking about a government or a thing. America is also an abstraction. It's an idea and an ideal. And I think what we're doing when we go off in search of America, is we're searching for a greater understanding of the place that we all call home. The second reason I think that phrase in search of America resonates with us as Americans is that it's rooted in our common immigrant experience. Unless you're a full-blooded Native American, the chances are that your ancestors came here in search of America, whether they came on the Mayflower, whether they left Europe in the war ravaged 20th century, whether they walked here from Central America to flee poverty, they all came in search of America, with one exception. And that, of course, are African Americans who came here against their will on slave ships. But they too, over time, became part of this American quilt. 
So that's why I think this phrase resonates. And I think it's why so many of us go off in search of America. So I'm gonna take you on this little journey with Albie and me today. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce you to Albie. Then I'm gonna explain what it was about rereading Travels with Charlie that inspired this trip. And then third, I'm gonna introduce you just a few of the people and places that we met on our 9,000 mile trip around the country and share a few observations about what we found in our search for America and what it was like traveling with a companion who can't complain about your driving, which was one of Albie's many virtues. So let me start, by the way, I should also say, we took this trip a little over two years ago. A lot has happened in America in two years. It's not exactly the same country we set out to find two years ago. But let me introduce you to my travel companion. I hope you can all see Albie there on the screen. In 2012, early 2012, Albie was found wandering alone, scared and hungry on a road in central Louisiana. He was one of hundreds of thousands of dogs in this country that are found every year, the lost, the abused, the abandoned, and the neglected, who through no fault of their own, find themselves <clears throat> in shelters around this country every year. Albie was a true underdog, and he's a very lucky dog to still be alive because the shelter where he was brought in central Louisiana is a high kill shelter where 90% of the dogs that come in will never leave. So he's, he was truly an underdog. And we adopted him sight unseen through a, a Connecticut organization called Labs for Rescue. And as lucky as Albie was, I think the luck was really ours because he has been a life changer for us. And knowing the fate that awaited Albie if we hadn't stepped up for him has made our bond and our relationship all the more poignant. But I do want to tell you that when we adopted Albie in 2012, I had been opposed to getting a family dog for over 20 years. I didn't want a dog. And my wife and my kids for 20 years, they were on me, they were on me. And I, when I finally relented, my wife was the one who said to me, well, what do you think about getting a rescue dog? I was so ignorant about dogs. I'm gonna show you a picture of what I thought a rescue dog was. This is what I thought a rescue dog was. I didn't know anything about these shelters down south. I didn't know there were hundreds of thousands of dogs that were in need of homes. We live in Massachusetts and I thought this is going to be a bit of overkill. But by the end of the day, I had learned, I had educated myself and I had learned what a rescue dog is. Albie made his trip north from the shelter in Louisiana on a truck operated by this man, Greg Maley, who operates rescue road trips. Every other week for over 10 years, Greg has brought 60 to 80 dogs like Albie up north to the Northeast, to their forever homes. And this was a picture taken before we had ever even met Albie. We saw it on Facebook when they had just crossed the Mason Dixon line. Now we didn't meet Greg when Albie got to Massachusetts because he was required by law here to go into quarantine for two days. And, you know, he had been from pillar to post. He was a stray. He'd been in this terrible shelter for five months. He's on this big, scary truck for four days. So he was a bit of an unguided missile when he got off that truck. But he was so sweet. And I was very curious about the work that Greg did and learning more, trying to learn more about this whole world of people, not just Greg, but all of the people who make it possible for dogs like Albie to get on Greg's truck to find their second chance in life. And so I persuaded Greg, I emailed him and persuaded him to let me travel with him just overnight from Pennsylvania to New England on one of his trips. And I wrote an article about it for Parade Magazine. And it got such a great response that my wife, Judy said, you've got to write a book about this. It's a great story. And Rescue Road was the book that resulted from my making several trips with Greg all the way from his home in Ohio down to Texas and Louisiana, bringing all these dogs north, sleeping in the trailer with the dogs, cleaning the poop, changing the, the litter, um, and helping him manage with one other person, 60 to 80 dogs per trip. 
It's a remarkable undertaking. But the book isn't just about Greg. It's about all the other people that you don't see who make these rescues possible. That book led me to write a follow-on called Rescued, which was really about what happens once these dogs arrive in our lives. You know, what are the challenges? What are the joys of giving a dog a second chance? After Rescue Road was published, I started to get a lot of pictures like this sent to me or posted on Facebook by people um, who had rescue dogs and who were moved by the book. Uh, literally hundreds of them I have on file. You can see the one little fellow, I think he's on your left, who found the book somewhat dull and fell asleep. But I have one favorite picture from the hundreds that I got, and it's this one, because one thing you learn is that everybody's a critic, and this dog apparently didn't like the book. So I love the look on his face because there's no, no sign of remorse whatsoever. So let me tell you a second, how do, what, what inspired me to take this trip when I picked up Travels with Charlie? I had first purchased that copy that you see pictured there when I was about 15 years old, a teenager in New Jersey. And I reread it again when I was 62 years old. Steinbeck wrote that book when he was about 58. He knew he was entering the autumn of his life. He was an American writer, he said, writing about America, but I had lost touch with the country that I was writing about. And that set him on this journey with his beloved French poodle, Charlie. And rereading Travels with Charlie really resonated with me. First of all, I was now in my, approaching my mid 60s, Albie, who was about two or three when we adopted him in 2012. It was now, you know, several years later, and he, dogs age faster than we do. So he was now kind of a late middle-aged guy like I was. And it kind of struck me that if we don't do something like this now, we may never get the chance. And I've always had a sort of, uh, always wrestled with my mortality to some degree. I would, the next slide sort of depicts my, my uneasy relationship with my own mortality. Um, you may remember this scene from The Wizard of Oz. This is how I pretty much felt as I approached my mid-60s, that the sand in my hourglass was running out, and it was time for an adventure. And so that's what inspired Albie and I to hit the road. So why take a dog, though, on a trip like this? What is it about traveling with a dog? Well, Steinbeck answered that question in Travels with Charlie. He said, a dog is a bond between strangers, many conversations en route began with what degree of dog is that? And that's exactly right. Wherever Albie and I went, we eased ourselves into conversations with strangers because Albie was such a magnet for everyone. People just wanted to meet Albie and they always had one of, the, the questions were predictable. What's his name? How old is he? What kind of dog is he? And can I pet him? So this was an easy way. Alby was my passport to conversation with strangers. So that's why travel with a dog. So in mid-April, two years ago, uh, we left home uh, here in Massachusetts in that little sports car uh, to make our trip uh, around America. Now, there's something that all of us pack when we travel on a trip, whether we drive or we're flying, wherever we're going, we pack something, we pack our clothes, we pack, if you're our, my age, you pack your medications. But there's something else we all pack and it doesn't weigh anything. And nobody's gonna inspect your bag and find it. And what I'm talking about is all the stereotypes and preconceptions that we have about people in other parts of the world or parts of the country. And it's important to be mindful of that. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how my stereotypes about certain parts of the country were challenged by the people that I met. Now, I wanted to follow some of Steinbeck's advice. When he made his trip in 1960, the interstate highway system was almost brand new. And he traveled the back roads because as he rode, if we, when we get these throughways, as he calls them, all the way across the country, you'll be able to drive from New York to California and not see anything. So I took that advice and we, I decided that we would as much as we practically could 
stick to secondary routes and not the interstate. And you can see that our route um, more or less paralleled Steinbeck's, but the point was not a recreation of Steinbeck's trip. Our trip was inspired by his, but it was not a recreation of it. There were so many differences traveling half a century or more later. Steinbeck traveled in a camper. We had a little sports car convertible. Steinbeck took his typewriter and carbon paper. I took my laptop. I had a cell phone with all my music and it had all the, I had a, all the navigation I needed in my phone, right? I didn't have to bring those un, unwieldy maps that Steinbeck would have unfolded at the table in the back of his camper. Our trip was a little bit shorter. We, we cut off some of the corners, but it was more or less the same route that Steinbeck took. One of my first questions when we left New England was how would we sense, when would we know that the North had become the South? Because you can drive from Pennsylvania, part of Pennsylvania, which we would all agree is a Northern state, to the Northern part of Virginia, which is a Southern state, in under 40 minutes. But where's the dividing line? I felt that we had reached the South a couple of days after we left when we reached this town of White Post, Virginia, near the Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah Valley. And it wasn't the presence of these dinosaurs. It was the fact that I looked up at the street sign where we had stopped and it said we were on the Patsy Cline Highway, named after the country western singer. I think you could spend your life driving the byways of New England and you're not going to find a road named for a country western singer is my bet. A little bit further down the road, we pulled into a parking lot and there was a truck with a bumper sticker and it said, American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. And I realized that we were truly now in the South. This is where we started a drive all the way to New, to New Orleans, where we got on the interstate only for 40 miles because we were detoured and forced to go. But we started by driving down the Skyline Drive. Many of you have probably done this drive. It runs through the Shenandoah National Park. It was mid-April. I was very optimistic we would have beautiful spring weather. I could put the top down in the car. It was 27 degrees the morning that we got up on the Skyline Drive. It was absolutely freezing. But we made our way all the way along the Shenandoah Ridge. And as you may know, when you get to the end of the um, Skyline Drive, you're at the northern end of the Blue Ridge Parkway, which runs for 400 and more than 450 miles through the mountains of Virginia and North Carolina. And it's an adventurous drive. It's spectacularly beautiful. You have to pay grit. You really have to pay close attention because in many cases, it almost felt like flying at times. And there are no, unlike the Skyline Drive, there aren't a lot of barriers, even on the treacherous curves. So you've got to pay close attention. But finally, we got far enough south. You could see Alby comfortably seated in the back of the convertible. We left Asheville, North Carolina. The day after it was 27 degrees on the Skyline Drive, it was 94 in Asheville. And we were cutting west across Tennessee for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But there are many ways to get from North Carolina into Tennessee. I picked US 129, a stretch of highway um, called the Tale of the Dragon. Now, usually when I'm gonna, doing these book talks, I ask people, has anybody heard of the Tale of the Dragon or ever been on it? And usually there's one or two people that have been on it. I regretted this decision for reasons I'll show you. This little stretch of highway, which crosses from North Carolina to Tennessee, is 11 miles long with 318 tight curves on a mountain road. And every motorcyclist and hot rodder in America is there to test the limit of their skills. This is a place that attracts people seeking this kind of adventure. And it's, these are not my pictures, fortunately. These are pictures I took from the internet. But this is what happens um, on the tail of the dragon. It's, I was absolutely terrified for about the hour it took us to go 11 miles, sometimes with motorcycles like that, just dying to pass me. We finally got to the bottom. It's, the road flattened out. I, I practically had to peel my fingers off the steering wheel. I was just so 
terrified of this tribe. I took a deep breath and I realized I hadn't checked on Albie. You know, as I turned around to see how Albie was doing, and he was having the time of his life. He, he would have done it all over again. And one of the reasons I'm showing you this picture is that when it was sometimes cold and I had the top down and he needed a break from the wind, Albie found a way to work himself behind this car seat cover. He was supposed to be on top of it, but he managed to work his way behind it and stick his head up um, so he could see what was happening. But he had a great time on the tail of the dragon. So the reason that we were driving west across Tennessee was that just south of Nashville, you can get on another parkway called the Natchez Trace Parkway, 444 miles, that runs from just south of Nashville all the way to Natchez, Mississippi. And it is glorious driving. It's, it's not as harrowing as the roads we had been on. It's, it's a little bit gentler and flatter. It's absolutely magnificent in the spring. About halfway down the Natchez Trace Parkway, by the way, I should say that the parkway commemorates an old footpath worn into the, the woodlands um, even before white settlers came to America. And it, this parkway is not, didn't pave over the path. It's, it commemorates the path, parts of which still exist. Our overnight stop while we were on the parkway was in Tupelo, Mississippi, in Northeast Mississippi. I'm not going to make this very political, but it's, it's one of the most conservative corners of one of the most conservative states in the country. It's, it's, El, it's the birthplace of Elvis Presley. For dinner that night, and of course we were often doing, having to do takeout because Albie was, couldn't go in a lot of restaurants, I had picked this place at random called Vanelli's on the main drag in Tupelo. And as we approached the restaurant, I met these two guys who were sitting on the bench out front. And you can see the guy with the guitar looks like quite a character, and he truly was. Turns out he was the owner of the restaurant, and he goes by Vaz. Uh, he's got a Vasily as his first name. And he turned out to be one of the great characters that we met on this trip. He spent the entire evening out in front of the restaurant greeting absolutely everybody that walked by. I called him the, the maitre d' of Main Street, policemen, kids black people, white people. He was just full of life and, you know, full of friendliness. And he, he confided to me later, he said, look, I'm a progressive guy in this very conservative town. And the, what I can do in this world is to bring a moment of happiness into the life of everybody who passes by. We ended up spending the entire evening together. He invited me to stay at his house, which we didn't do because we had already checked into our motel and he told me he had cats, which Albie would not have done well with. Well, we've been only talking about 45 minutes when he just spontaneously jumped up, and I hope you can hear this. I'm going to just play you a short segment of an impromptu song that he made up right while I was standing there. And he's gigging. He's on his way across the USA. Well, he never told me his name, and if he did, I forgot. But he seems like a fellow that's really full of it. Full of what? He's got the stuff. Yeah. He's got the good stuff. The point, you know, I realized after this evening with him, this is one of the reasons we travel, is to meet characters like this, you know, people that are just, you know, free spirits. Um, and he was one of the real memorable characters that we met. You know, he was, as he stood outside, he would tell the kids to go in and tell the people behind the counter they'd have a free soda. You know, he had candy in his pocket for the kids. He was just a, a real character. And I, I, I loved spending time with him. From Tupelo, we were on our way to New Orleans. Um, there's an important chapter in Travels with Charlie about New Orleans because um, Steinbeck, and, when Steinbeck was in New Orleans, it was the middle of school integration. And there was a lot of really ugly things happening in New Orleans. And you may, if you read the book, you may recall the chapter. He, he found it all incredibly disturbing and it kind of put an end to his trip. He was traveling the country uh, counterclockwise. We were going uh, clockwise. So we were more at the beginning of our trip. But we were headed to New Orleans because my, my son still lives there. He'd gone to college there. And I'm not gonna spend really any time talking about New Orleans except to tell you 
that when, before my son went to school there, I had never been there. And I kind of saw it as a dangerous and dark place. I have come to love New Orleans. It's the most unique city in America. There is no place like it. It's got a, you know, a spirit that I think is really unmatched. We spent a couple of days in New Orleans, but the reason I wanted to tell you about our, about our last night there is that I was beginning to feel anxious the night before we left New Orleans. Why? Because the next day, I had planned for us to go to Alexandria, Louisiana. That is where Albie was found and where he spent five months in the shelter. While working on the previous books, I had met the, the two women who really were responsible for saving his life. One does rescue work in that part of Louisiana, and the other is a volunteer at the shelter where Albie survived for five months. Most dogs don't last a week, but Albie survived because this volunteer took a real shine to him and kept him alive for five months. And I had arranged to have a reunion with those two women with an Albie because they, and I'll show you the picture, they, um, that's Krista, uh, Krista on the right is the shelter volunteer that won the sunglasses and um, Carrie on the left was our adoption coordinator for Labs for Rescue. And this is the shelter where Albie was just outside it was the only place that made sense for us all to meet because Krista was volunteering that day. And then before we left New Orleans, I had this awful feeling that Albie might remember the place even years later. Something about the smell that he might think I was returning him. So I was really concerned about meeting at the shelter, but it was fine. He didn't seem to have any memory of the place. And I don't think he remembered Krista and Carrie but they remembered him and that was the important thing. The people who do this work, the people who save dogs like Albie, they see so much heartbreak, so much cruelty, so many sick and abused dogs, and they often don't get to see the happy endings. They don't often get to see these dogs ever again once they get on Greg's truck. So I wanted them to see him again, to see how his life had turned out. It was one of the most poignant moments of the entire trip. So from Alexandria, we were headed to another place that I didn't have a carefully delineated agenda, but there was one other town that we were that I wanted to visit on this trip. And it might surprise you what it was, and you may not at first understand why. It was Okima, Oklahoma, um, which is east of about an hour east of Oklahoma City. And the clue to why I wanted to visit Okima is actually in the photograph. It was the, it's the birthplace and the hometown of Woody Guthrie, the great American folk singer who, for the same reasons I always loved John Steinbeck, I always loved Woody Guthrie. Because he sang for the dispossessed and the, the powerless and the poor. And I wanted to see the town that had basically raised Woody Guthrie. So we pulled in to Okima on a Saturday. I didn't expect to be there more than an hour or two, but it turned out um, the day we arrived, there was a big festival in town. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. Woody Guthrie, I want to just talk for a moment about Woody Guthrie and John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck was the great chronicler in prose of the Dust Bowl. Grapes of Wrath was all about, you remember the Joad family fleeing Oklahoma for what they thought were greener pastures in California. Woody Guthrie chronicled that same migration of hundreds of thousands of Americans, but he did it in song. And when The Grapes of Wrath was a very popular book, it was made into a very popular movie, which you've probably seen, in 1940, starring Henry Fonda. And Victor Records, it was Woody Guthrie's record label, wanted to capitalize on the popularity of the film. And they asked Woody to write some songs about the Dust Bowl. And one of them was called Tom Joad, after the main character in Rapes of Wrath. And Steinbeck and Guthrie met several times in their life. And Steinbeck once quipped that he wished that Guthrie had written that song earlier. It would have saved him all the trouble of writing the Grapes of Wrath. So this is the main drag in Okima, Oklahoma. 
we were very lucky, as it turned out completely by chance, the day we arrived was Pioneer Day, a big annual festival in town. And also the high school class reunion for many of the classes, including my cohort, the, the classes of, I think it was 68 to 73 or somewhere around there. I was high school class of 71. So there were a lot of people out on Main Street for the festivities that day. Okima, Oklahoma is very emblematic of what's happened to a lot of towns in the American heartland. It's a shadow of its former self. Several of the people I talked to on town that day who were home for their reunion used the same word. I heard it several times from different people. They said, you know, what's happened to this town is really disappointing. So it's a town in the heartland. It's a you know, politically very conservative place. We got the warmest welcome in this town. Um, everybody we met was happy to talk, to share their story. Everybody had family stories that related somehow to the Guthrie family. I was lucky to meet um, Lance Warren on the left and Waylon Bishop, the fellow in the, uh, in the hat, is sort of the unofficial town historian. And he took me on a tour of the Historical Society with all these artifacts of Woody Guthrie's life, including a reconstruction of his childhood home out of some of the original materials, which is where they're standing. And, um, you know, everybody was so happy to share their story and everybody was so, I expressed great gratitude that we cared enough to come to their town. Now, it's interesting that for many years since Woody Guthrie's death in the late 60s, Okima didn't want anything to do with the legacy of Woody Guthrie because of his socialist and communist politics. And Okima is a conservative place. So when Guthrie wanted to donate his papers and have his remains brought back to Okima, well, the library didn't want to have, didn't even want to take his papers. So his widow had his ashes scattered over the Atlantic Ocean. Generations came, you know, came and went, times changed. Um, I think it was in the late 90s, the, the first Woody Fest was held, a folk music festival held every July, probably not this year, um, to honor Woody Guthrie's legacy. During this day, uh, word got out, I mean, since before I knew it, people were coming up to me. This, this woman, uh, Mary Coleman, about 90 then, she came up and said, are you the fellow from Boston I heard about? And she wanted to tell me a lot about her growing up in Okima and she plays the open mic at the Woody Festival with her 92-year-old brother. And as she, we had a wonderful conversation. As she turned to go, she walked about five steps and she turned around. She said, thank you so much for coming to Okima. And I thought these people were just so genuine and warm. And during the day, I was introduced to a fellow named Curtis Walker. I don't know if Curtis may be on this. He signed up, he registered. I don't know if he's on the call, on the, the Zoom. I was introduced to, to Curtis and earlier in the day and we chatted on and off and he was staffing a table where they were raising money to save those three water towers that I showed you a picture of. And he said, listen, he, he, his, father, his grandfather had tried to create a memorial to Woody Guthrie back in the 60s and bought the old Woody Guthrie property, the property he grew up on, the house isn't there anymore. He said, after the parade, I'll take you over to the property, which is where this picture was taken. You can see there's a tree stump there with some of this land is your land, uh, carved into it by a sculptor who lives across the street. I said earlier that we pack our preconceptions when we travel. As Curtis and I walked over to the property, it was the first time all day we'd been, we had a chance to actually just be alone, he, he and Albie and I. And he said something to me that really took me aback at first. He kind of leaned over and gave me a bit of a stage whisper. He said, you know, I'm like the gay black guy in this town. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this got very strange, very fast. What does he mean? And he said, I'm a liberal, he said. And I realized in that moment that, you know, here I was traveling in my little convertible with my rescue dog from Massachusetts. And he had sized me up politically. I had learned during the day that he was an Iraq war veteran, Army Reserve, grew up in Okima, and I figured he's, you know, he's probably a pretty conservative guy. Well, he wasn't. And we had a, he was, I think, very happy to have someone that shared his politics to talk to. Um, 
at the end of the day, he insisted on buying me a beer at a local popular hangout and introduced me to one of the owners. And he explained to me that they, they were a couple of two gay men who had moved to Okima and bought uh, Lou's Rocky Road Tavern. And I said to him afterwards, I said, what is it like for them in this town being a gay couple? And he said, you know, nobody cares about their sexuality here. He said, they're fine people and that's all we care about. That's all anybody in town cares about. And I say this by way of admitting to my own stereotypes about this part of the country. I thought, how could these guys be welcome in a small town in Oklahoma? So I really learned something that day. Um, as we were leaving Okima, we were now on Interstate 40, which is largely displaced uh, the iconic Route 66. In Rapes of Wrath, the Jode family follows Route 66 from, Sal from their home in, well, east of 66, Salislaw, Oklahoma. And they pick up 66 around Oklahoma City all the way to California. John Steinbeck in Rapes of Wrath called it the Mother Road. So we were now more or less paralleling the route that the Jode family took as they fled the Dust Bowl. Now, you can't literally follow 66 anymore, except in bits and pieces. Some of it's been abandoned, some of it's been replaced by interstate, some of it now, uh, old Route 66 is the main street in certain towns. But we went across the Texas Panhandle, and then, um, you know, it really is worth, as you travel on the Interstate 40, which is the old 66, to get off in these towns like Tucumcari and really experience this sort of bit of Americana. The art, the murals on the walls all over this part of the country are worth the trip in themselves to see this sort of iconic artwork. But it was in New Mexico, and this picture I obviously didn't take. This is a famous picture by Ansel Adams. Moonrise over New Mexico. And the reason I show it to you is, is I want to tell you this story. It was in New Mexico that I realized that even though Albie and I had been together every minute of every day, every mile, all the way to New Mexico, this, was the, this is where I learned that Albie and I were not exactly on the same trip. What do I mean? When we, we were in Santa Fe, we checked into a motel up in the foothills. And it was about 11 o'clock at night and I was tired, I was ready for bed, but I thought Albie probably needs one more chance to do his business outside. And we stepped outside and I looked across at the, the mountain range across the valley. And I thought there was a, just the faintest little milky white light behind the mountains. And I looked around and I thought, you know what? I wonder if the moon's gonna rise behind the mountains. The, you know, the desert air, it's so clear up there. And I thought if the moon's gonna rise, it's gonna be absolutely spectacular. So I waited and sure enough, the light got brighter and brighter and brighter until the moon just started to break the ridge. And you know, if you've watched the sunrise or set or moonrise or moonset, just as it's at the horizon, it seems to move. You can almost seem to watch it rise. You're seeing the rotation of the earth bring it into view. And I was lost in the absolute like a, some kind of cosmic reverie. I was so taken with this breathtaking sight. And I looked over at Albie and he was facing the other way. He had no interest in the moonrise and I couldn't even get him to turn around to look at it. And I realized that for all we were seeing, he was having a very different experience than I was having. You know, I could appreciate the natural beauty. He could smell things and look around, but I realized we're not exactly on the same trip. And we're not going to be looking at pictures of this trip in six weeks or six months or six years and saying, oh, wasn't that a beautiful night that we had together? The same scene sort of repeated itself a couple of days later at the Grand Canyon. I hadn't been there in 50 years. It was cold. It was snowy. We drove up from Flagstaff to go to Grand Canyon, walked through the slush to the canyon rim, and it was fogged in solid. You couldn't see six inches into the Grand Canyon. You could sense it, that great yawning chasm. And I, I said, I haven't come all this way to be shut out like this. So I, I explained to Albie, he was very agreeable. I said, we're gonna walk 
no matter how long it takes, we're going to wait till this is a break in the weather. And it took hours, but we finally got a break. And you can see, uh, see it behind you. And it was all very dramatic. If you've been to Grand Canyon on a clear, sunny day, it's beautiful, but it's static. It looks almost like a postcard. The weather was wild. There were snow squalls and fog and curtains of rain, and it made it all very dramatic. But I realized again, I'm, I'm loving this view. Albie, he didn't care <laughs> so much about the view. He was more interested in the squirrels. So I'm gonna get you through the rest of this a little bit more quickly, because we, we, we crossed into California at the town of, uh, into California at Needles, which is where the Jode family crossed the Colorado on Route 66 from Arizona into California, where their hopes for this wonderful life of picking fruits and vegetables and having money in their pocket were dashed because the, the migrants who reached California were treated horribly. Their camps were burned at night. They were looked down on. They were spat on. They were forced to work for slave wages. You know, the, the land of milk and honey, that dream never materialized. We drove up the Central Valley of California um, uh, to, through Steinbeck's, Steinbeck's hometown of Salinas, where the National Steinbeck Center is, and finally reached the West Coast at Half Moon Bay, California. I'm going to very much abbreviate the return to give you time to ask questions, but I will tell you that from here we headed up into Eastern Oregon, which may be the most desolate part of the United States. You don't think of Oregon as being desolate, but east of the mountains, uh, it is high desert, and it is as empty a place as you can imagine. There's a county, Harney County, where we went. It's where the, you may remember the standoff at that wildlife refuge a couple of years ago between the, the Bundys arm and it took over a federal wildlife refuge. That's in Harney County. Harney County is bigger than Massachusetts. It has 7,000 people in the entire county. We were in Boise, and then one of the most beautiful parts of the trip was across Idaho. I will tell you that we were traveling on Route 20, a state uh, across Idaho, stopped in a, in a general store, and I got into a conversation with the guy, and he said, oh, he, he, he said we were driving back to Boston, and he asked me a question that took me completely by surprise. He said, are you taking Route 20 all the way to Boston? I said, what do you mean? Well, it turns out, I didn't know this, but you may know Route 20. It goes through Waltham and Weston and out through Brimfield and Lenox. It's the same Route 20. It's the longest highway in America. It starts in Kenmore Square or ends in Kenmore Square, all the way to Newport, Oregon. Um, Idaho was beautiful. I want to tell you about somebody else we met on the trip. I stopped to get coffee in Bismarck, North Dakota, <laughs> Albie was waiting in the car, it was raining, and I saw this contraption bicycle outside with this can, you know, this stuff all, you know, packed into this trailer, and I figured it was a homeless person, I didn't know. I went into the Starbucks, I said, well, it'll probably be pretty obvious who this bicycle belongs to. I didn't see anyone for a few minutes, and this, this fellow, Lewis, came out of the men's room and sat down at the table next to me, and I said, well, this has to be the guy, right? So I struck up a conversation with Lewis. Lewis had been on the road at that point for over two years on this bicycle, which is too small for him, with all his worldly belongings in it. I said, well, what started you on this trip? Because he started in Florida. He's an ex-Marine. He said he was in a coffee shop in Florida, and he was waiting in line, and there was somehow the guy in front of him was in uniform, an Afghan war vet, and the woman behind the cash register got into an argument about the war in Afghanistan. And Lewis said, I wanted to reach across the counter and smack her, he said. And but what was really interesting is that Lewis and I, and by the way, I should say this very morning, there was a big school shooting in Houston. And Lewis and I spoke very amicably for an hour about politics, which I often, which I didn't bring up in conversation. I usually, if people wanted to talk politics, I let it come to me. I'll put it mildly and just tell you that my politics and Lewis's are about as opposite as they can get. But we 
I really liked him. And he really was curious about our trip and he wanted to meet Albie. And he was tickled because I had an extra copy of Rescue Road, which I gave him. He said, you wrote this book? And anyway, you know, I would have, and he told me some stories that were hair raising to me um, politically. But I realized, you know, we all have to live, we have to, I have to live in Lewis's country. He has to live in my country. And one of the takeaways of this entire trip, but again, this was two years ago, and I think things unfortunately have worsened, is that wherever we went, I felt there was a real reservoir of goodwill out there. Where, you know, no matter whether we were in red states or blue states, people were helpful. In Tennessee, we were at a coffee shop and I asked if Albie could have a cup of whipped cream and when they brought it out, they had put three pieces of bacon on it for him. You know, this is just the kind of thing that people will do. And I, it makes me think there is a reservoir of goodwill out there, but we're in danger of letting it run dry. Um, I'm gonna skip all the way across the country to our last stop. This is a town that I'm sure many of you, especially from Tewksbury, are familiar with, Agunquit, Maine. Um, five weeks earlier, when we were in Tennessee, my cell phone rang and it was an old family friend, a woman who had grown up with my mother in Brookline. She was then about 90, she was then 94. Her husband, Paul, was then 99. She and her husband, Paul, were my, my legal guardians. I always knew growing up in New Jersey that if something happened, that was the euphemism we used, right? If something happened to my parents, we would go to live with Winnie and Paul Mason in Brookline. They've been very important people in my life. And Winnie, when she called me, reached me in Tennessee, but she didn't know I was on the trip. And I told her where we were. And they had since many years ago moved to Agunquit, where they always had a cottage and where we used to spend our summer vacations as kids growing up since we were little. And it dawned on me that it was gonna be the perfect ending to this trip. I said, Winnie, I said, I'm gonna make, we're gonna to come to a gun quit before we go home. You know, when people are that old and they've meant that much to you, you don't know when you're gonna see them again or if you'll see them again. Our last night on the road, we spent actually at a motel in Bennington, Vermont. And I, by that point, was very much ready to be home. I think Albie was ready to be home. Um, but we had made a promise and I, I was determined to keep it. So that morning, we drove to a gun quit. Um, we visited with Winnie and Paul, 95 and 99 years old. Then I took Albie down uh, to the Footbridge Beach, which you may be familiar with. And unfortunately, we ran into this sign, um, which Albie found rather amusing. Um, when I was a kid, we used to catch crabs on drop lines off of this bridge. And the older kids that we knew used to dive off this bridge. And it's been rebuilt since then, but I, I was tempted to, I was going to tempt fate and walk Albie over, but I decided not to. And just before we decided to drive home, I went down to Perkins Cove, which I think many of you know. Um, and I, this is how I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to a close. You may know this spot. There's a little spit of land that separates the cove, which is behind me in this view, and the ocean. And it was now about 6.30 at night. And we were about to drive home. Um, and I'm just going to read you the last couple of paragraphs of the book. I, uh, I said, I took a seat on a bench overlooking the ocean side, which is where that picture was taken. Albie is always close by my side. The evening was warm, the light was golden, and the ocean was unusually calm. How many times had I sat in this very spot and watched the ocean lap up against these craggy rocks? Excuse me. And then I looked down at Albie, and every time I think I couldn't love him any more than I do, I do. As we soaked up the view and took in this serene evening, my mind wandered back across the decades and over the past six weeks. We had more than 9,000 miles behind us and just 90 to go. I had nearly 65 years behind me and an unknown number, but far fewer to go. And Alby too, now about nine, was closer to the end than the beginning. All of these journeys were slowly ebbing away. Albie, 
dear sweet Ernest Alvey sat quietly by me, quietly by me for about another half an hour before I mustered the energy to stand up and ready myself for the drive home. I gave him a long, long hug and thanked him for being with me, for being so patient over so many miles, miles that were no doubt far more interesting for me than they were for him. This gentle old soul, once lost in the woods of central Louisiana, and now part of who I am and will forever be, an enormous surge of gratitude that fate had brought us together washed over me. And then we walked over to the takeout window at Barnacle Billy's and I bought him a vanilla ice cream cone. And that's how the travelers came home again. So thank you all for listening and um, I hope it worked on Zoom and I think we're gonna have some questions if you have them. Great, thank you so much. Thank you.